So the European economy would be in a severe recession. It's already entering that, and but with serious consequences. People are going to die of hypothermia. Uh, Japan is hit the wall. China, they, you know, they're not transparent about their numbers. They lie about a lot of what they do, but they're probably in a recession this year. Which, considering it's the world's second largest economy and is used to seven to ten percent growth, the idea that they're even in the single digits, let alone a recession, is shocking. But they are. And the U.S. is is not far behind. We're looking at a severe recession. So the economic outlook is miserable, and that'll be reflected in stocks. Jim Rickards is an American lawyer, economist, investment banker, speaker, media commentator, and author on matters of finance and precious metals. Jim discusses his just-released book, Sold Out, How Broken Supply Chains, Surging Inflation, and Political Instability Will Sink the Global Economy, where he argues that the global supply chain built up and in existence over the past few decades cannot be fixed but ultimately replaced with a new one. Why? There are many reasons he cites in today's video, but perhaps one of the biggest is a once-in-a-century decoupling of the world's two largest economies and trading partners, which will have ripple effects for years to come. This is leading to what he argues is the building of supply chain 2.0, and it is being pursued by both countries at the same time, not just the United States nor China alone. He also focuses on broken global supply chains, surging inflation, and the fastest rise in interest rates in our history. Add to that a Western world that is on the verge of bankruptcy, thanks to overconsumption and undersavings since 1971, and you have the potential for a global depression akin to or possibly worse than that of the 1930s. Even prior to COVID and the Ukraine war records predicted that when this current bubble implodes, national central banks would themselves become bankrupt and thus give way to the IMF that would replace the United States dollar as the world's reserve currency with the SDR, a unit of currency that would include various currencies and gold. With central banks now losing control of inflation, forcing interest rates dramatically higher, Rickard's prediction that central banks are heading into bankruptcy is indeed coming true. COVID and the war in Ukraine are no doubt accelerating the demise of the existing dollar-based fiat system. Listen in as Jim explains the long-term outlook for the global economy, the global supply chain, energy, and how today's events fit within this broader trend, including some of the implications he believes to come from this. The economic outlook is not good. We're, in, uh, we're entering a, uh, what I expect will be a very severe global recession. There are lots and lots of indicators of that. It looks like the United States had a, um, a mild recession in the first half of 2022. Uh, growth in the first quarter was uh, negative, about negative 1.6 percent uh, annualized. Second quarter was uh, negative 0.9 percent, again, annualized approximately. But two consecutive quarters of declining GDP, that's the – you know, the standard definition of a, of a recession. Uh, and we had that. Um, now it looks like the third quarter, we're going to get that number, um, uh, you know, shaping up. And, uh, third quarter is relatively strong. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, perhaps that recession in uh, the first half was, was merely technical or relatively mild. That looks like the case. But a lot of the third quarter GDP and, and that, that number is, uh, you know, is coming strong is inventory accumulation. Now, this is the way they do GDP. It's not all final sales. It's actually inventory. Now, that's a purchase. And if there's some you know net margin at the retail level, they pick that up separately. And that's okay as long as the inventory is going out the door in the form of sales. <laughs> but the, the smarter economists I know look at those two things separately, and they judge more by final sales. And those are not holding up. So the European economy will be in a severe recession. It's already entering that, and but with serious consequences. People are going to die of hypothermia. Uh, Japan is hit the wall. China, they, you know, they're not transparent about their numbers. They lie about a lot of what they do, but they're – probably in a recession this year, which considering it's the world's second largest economy and it's used to 7 to 10 percent growth, the idea that they're even in the single digits, let alone a recession, is shocking, but they are. And the U.S. is, is not far behind. We're looking at a severe recession. So the economic outlook is miserable, and that'll be reflected in stocks. I was going to say, um, now you mentioned financial. Let's kind of look at that separately. And a lot of people confuse the two. There are recessions in business cycles, and as I, I expect, we're entering a severe recession right now. But there are also financial crises, uh, which we've seen, you know, 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis, 1998, the Russia long-term capital management crisis. I had a front row seat on that one. I actually negotiated that um, 
that Fed sponsored rescue plan for on behalf of long term capital. Uh, 2008, obviously the global financial crisis. 2020, uh, I, I don't quite know how to describe that. I mean, the economy goes down uh, 31 percent, 31 percent. And, and it, you say two quarters. That's the way it shows up in the uh, Commerce Department reports. But it was actually two months, March and April, which happened to be in two different quarters, first mm-hmm. and second. Mm-hmm. But it was a two month like just that's what happens when you turn off the light, shut down the whole economy. That's what happens. But then the third quarter, it was up 35 percent on an annualized basis. So that, that was just sort of a strange experiment in turning off the lights. But um, so we have these um, financial crises and then we have recessions. They don't always go together. 1990 was a recession with no financial crisis. 1998 was a financial crisis with no recession. The economy was doing fine through all that, even though we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. 2008 was interesting because we had both. That was a genuine one deep recession, the worst since the Great Depression, and a financial crisis because we saw the sequential collapse of Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Lehman Brothers, AIG, Morgan Stanley was days away from going bust, Goldman was not far behind, etc. until the Fed came in, truncated the process and bailed everybody out. So um, so we just talked about how we're in going into a severe recession. Mm-hmm. Is, there, is there a financial crisis on the horizon also? And the answer is yes. And you say, well, how do you know that? The signs are there. Nobody's looking. Or I should, shouldn't say nobody. Very few people are looking. Mm-hmm. Certainly not the Fed. But we see it in the uh, Treasury yield curve. It's inverted. And just uh, for the for the benefit of the listeners, um, a normal yield curve is upward sloping. So you have time along the X axis, you have rates along the Y axis, and the curve of rates at different maturities goes up. And that makes sense. If sure. I'm going to you know, lend you money overnight, I'll have a certain rate. If I'm going to lend you money for 10 years, I might want a little more. Or you or anybody else or somebody lends me money for 10 years, you're going to want a higher interest rate because there's more risk. It's as simple as that. Rickards believes we have been in a deflationary environment for the past 20 years, with the Fed caught in a desperate and losing race to increase the money supply in the face of rapidly decreasing money velocity. The term velocity refers here to the rate of turnover in the money supply, the number of times $1 is used to purchase final goods and services. The higher the velocity, the more upward inflation pressure. Think of it this way, if a central bank creates a pile of new money and no one spends it, how can prices go up? The $7 trillion of new money multiplied by zero use still equals zero. According to Rickards, that's what's been occurring over the past 20 years, and especially since the start of the pandemic. Money velocity in the United States peaked in 1998 and has been falling ever since. Today, it's half of what it was in 1998. Fed policy has been on a dismal 20-year run of failure. The reasons behind this trend, the theory goes, are deflationary forces at play, changing demographics, technology and automation, high debt loads, and most importantly, precautionary savings all play a role in keeping prices down. Precautionary savings occurs when people are uncertain about the future. They tend to save, not spend. Well, what does it mean when the yield curve is inverted? It means that rates are projected to go lower. Mm-hmm. at longer maturity. So wait a second, why would I take a lower rate for a longer term loan? Uh, the answer is I expect interest rates to come down generally. I'm mm-hmm. looking, looking for an interest rate crash, which is sounds like a good thing, but it's not because it would only happen if you had a financial crisis of mm-hmm. some kind. Even more, a little more technical, same idea, but even more disconcerting is the euro dollar futures curve. Now, again, what's a euro dollar? Well, they're, they're dollar denominated deposits and loans among big banks outside of the Fed's jurisdiction. So that's what a euro dollar is. And but there's a big overnight market. You know, I lent you overnight and we roll it over the next day and the next day and the next day and so forth. So it's a very short term rate. It's basically an overnight rate. But in the futures market, you can bet on or take a position on what that rate's going to be six months from now, a year mm-hmm. from now, two years from now, etc. So it's a it's a long term bet on a short term rate. Um, that yield curve is inverted, and that almost never happens. But it, the inversion starts around uh, March 2023, where you know rates go up between now and then. Well, that makes sense because the the Fed controls short term rates. They told us they're going up. We know they're going up. Just have to listen to them and believe them. But when you get out to around March 2023, they start to go down a lot. And so what does that mean? The euro dollar market. These are the biggest players in the world. This is not your, uh, you know, uh, the retail account or, your, yeah. you know, your 
your your father's Merrill Lynch account or whatever. Mm-hmm. These, these are the, these are the big guys: sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, central banks, um, major institutions in in very large dollar amounts, but the biggest banks in the world. So it's serious money. They know what they're doing. And they're saying that rates are coming down starting in March. Again, not a good thing. Like, hey, aren't lower rates uh, great for everybody? Well, not if it, not if it's because there's a dollar shortage, not if it's because there's a liquidity crisis. So we see using standard economic indicators of the kind I described, you know, inventories, real incomes are negative. They're, they're going down. Everyone says, uh, Jay, hey, look at, you know, look at the latest report from the Labor Department, real, uh, you know, income, wages went up 5%. Yeah, they did, but inflation is 8%. Mm -hmm. So your real income went down 3. It's 5 minus 8 equals Mm -hmm. negative 3, at least where I went to school. So you've got declining real wages, inventory stockpile, which means no new orders, sales slowing, unemployment going up, uh, layoff announcements almost every day. So the, the, the real economy is in terrible shape. But it looks like we might have a financial crisis on the horizon also. So it kind of is setting up like 2008, but maybe worse. According to Rickards, the primary explanatory variable is psychology. It's about how people feel. If they feel prosperous and that real incomes are rising, asset values are rising and jobs are secure, they will spend more, banks will lend more and velocity will rise. If they feel anxious that real incomes are stagnant, that asset values may be in bubble territory, or that their jobs are not secure, they will save more and borrow less. If banks feel the same uncertainty, they will tighten credit and velocity will fall. Rickards believes we are looking at the latter case right now. What will be your next move as regards the collapsing global economic structure? Will you be part of those who survive this crash? Let us know your opinions in the comment section. Also, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching.